I don't want any trouble. Please don't hurt me. Here, take, take what you want. Take my wallet. Take whatever you want. No, please. Whoa, what, what, what happened? Oh, yeah, those robbers beat me up. I, I got to do some. Oh, yeah, I have a lot of broken things. I can't move. Maybe someone will come along and help me. Oh, I think I hear someone. I think, I think he saw me. Wait, what are you doing? Don't, don't leave. What, what's he saying? I can't get involved. Someone else will come and help. I'm late for a meeting at church anyway. Some church member he is. Oh, I think I hear someone else. What? He did the same thing. He, I think he looked at me. I heard him say something, and then he left. I think I heard him say, boy, that guy should have been more careful. A man in my position can't get involved in things like this. I'm sure someone else will come along. I can't believe it. You know, he looked familiar, though. I, I think he's in politics. He doesn't have much to do with the poor and lowly. I think he just figures everyone wants a, a handout. Man, I am not in good shape here. Man, won't somebody help me? Another person. He's coming over. He doesn't smell so good, though. Oh, it's a town drunk. Figures that's the help I'd get. Wait, he's helping me up. He put me in the back seat of his car. He's driving me. So he drove me to the hospital. Wow, the town drunk is the one who actually helped me when those other men couldn't be bothered to help. Imagine that. Well, you probably guessed by now that uh, that was uh, a modern retelling of this uh, parable we study today from the perspective of the guy who is beaten in the story. Now, hearing it both in the scripture reading earlier and in this modern retelling of it, maybe our question, our response would be, why? Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody see someone in need, half dead, and pass by? It's a little hard to believe, right? And yet, actually, I, it, it happens today as well. I could simply tell you the story of Hugo from April 18th, 2010 in New York City, where basically the exact same thing happened, and a guy was left for dead with many people walking past him on the street. We don't live that far in our world from this kind of story. Now, in Jesus' story, it's a dangerous road that these people are traveling on between Jerusalem and Jericho. Uh, we could look at some details from uh, Kenneth Bailey, who is a New Testament scholar. He uh, knew very well the culture of the Middle East, and so he writes this book through peasant eyes. And he helps us a little bit with that question of why, at least in Jesus' day. Why the priest and the Levite would pass by. And they're not really maybe satisfying answers, but they at least get us into the heads of these two guys. You see, the man's injuries, the man who was beaten, his injuries were kind of in a, a gray area of the law. These two religious leaders, they didn't really know if the rules allowed them to help this guy. I mean, this guy was stripped naked, so he had no clothes on, which meant for them that they couldn't really tell if he was Jewish, if he was one of them. It was often indicated by the clothing that people wore. And so just looking at the man in his flesh, they couldn't tell. Not only that, but this man, we're told, was also near death. So it's likely he couldn't actually speak out loud. And so in their minds, the likelihood is, well, this man's probably dead. And there were rules about that too. You as a Jewish person, did not touch the dead. In other words, because the priest and Levite could not be sure that the man was one of their own and was alive, 
both decided the best thing to do was to pass by. In addition, the priest and Levite were probably returning home to Jericho on this road after a a two-week period of service in their their, uh, positions as priest and Levite. We've seen how the priest would not even come near the wounded man and just passed by. The way it's written, the Levite sounds like he at least comes over to the man, but then he too chooses to pass by. And so I think it's possible, quite likely in fact, that the Levite thought, well, you know, if the priest didn't help, why would I as his underling question his wisdom and his ethics and help myself? So the choice on my part should be the same. Ultimately, as we see in the story, both concluded that the rules clearly stated that they could not help. They both concluded the rules are there for a reason, and the rules were so strong that they trumped the motion and emotion necessary for action. You know what's interesting about this whole story, too? is that Jesus actually tells it in response to this young expert on law and tradition. This is a a Jewish guy who knows the law backwards and forwards. He's a lawyer of the day. And so he comes out with all of his knowledge to test Jesus and maybe even to incite the crowd. And so for him, as Jesus tells this story, it certainly would have been disturbing that the one who did actually help the man who was beaten was a Samaritan. The group of people, the nationality of people who were hated by the Jewish people, that's the one who would actually go and help a Jewish man who was on this road. All because this Samaritan was moved by compassion. He simply sees someone in need, doesn't matter who the guy is or what his condition is, he does what is needed, and he does way more, doesn't he? Kenneth Bailey, the author I commented on earlier, he writes that a Samaritan putting up a Jew in an inn, probably in Jericho, would have been something like a Plains Indian walking into Dodge City in 1875 with a wounded cowboy on his horse, then checking into a room atop a saloon and spending the night taking care of that cowboy. That Indian would be fortunate to get out of Dodge alive. That's the courage of the Samaritan to not only stop and save the man, but to actually take him to an inn and continue to provide for his care. For the young lawyer and for us, the parable then is a lesson about the power of compassion to trump boundaries. The young man who knew the law said that the law was summed up as love your neighbor as yourself. But then he turns around and thinks he can pick and choose who his neighbor is based on his own nice, tidy boundaries. Ultimately, the question that prompted the, pa- the parable was, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' answer is clear. The very next person you meet, no matter what. Jesus says, love them, no matter what. And suddenly, the rules are shattered. The social norms are no more. The fences come down when compassion wins out. So with that in mind, I'd like to leave you with this then. Since the earliest days of the church, listeners of Jesus' parable have understood that the ultimate meaning of the parable is the good Samaritan is Jesus Christ. And we, all of us here today, are the wounded and the dying. The man who is left half dead. The the man who is left broken and injured. But Jesus, in his incredible love and compassion toward us, 
sees our need, sees our sinfulness, our brokenness, and cares for us. And Jesus, too, pays dearly for his compassion. But he acts willingly and resolutely to rescue and care for us beyond anything we could imagine. That's what this Lenten journey is all about as we we prepare for Holy Week and ultimately for Easter. That Jesus' mercy is extravagant. That his love is reckless. That he is for us a living sacrifice. And so if Jesus is that for us, may we do the same the next time we see our neighbor in need. The very next person you meet. Love them. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.